Now, what can investors expect from Sino-U.S. relations going forward? Can we expect to see reconciliation between the two countries? Well, first of all, I don't think there should be a reconciliation because okay. um, China has killed tens of thousands of Americans, and mm -hmm. this was a deliberate act. Mm -hmm. um, but if people want to have trade with China, I think it's going to be difficult. You know, right now, everything hinges on whether China will actually go through with its commitments in the phase one trade deal signed January 15th. There have been a number of conflicting statements from state media, so we really don't know where it's going. But we did hear President Trump in the middle of this month in May actually talk about how he is not willing to renegotiate the phase one deal. So if China actually decides not to go through and, and honor its uh, purchase commitments, this is going to be even more tense. I suspect, David, and I don't know, of course, but I suspect that China will make purchases uh, at least towards its uh, uh, commitment of an additional $200 billion of goods over two years, because not to do so would mean a break, a complete break in, in relations with the United States. Now, in light of what you just said, the Trump administration has decided to escalate trade wars in a sense. Uh, just this week, the U.S. Senate has passed legislation that could remove and delist some Chinese companies from U.S. exchanges. Do you think now is a wise time to be escalating the trade war, Gordon? Well, I don't see this as an escalation of the trade war. I mean, what the Senate is doing is it's saying that Chinese companies have to comply with the same disclosure rules as other right. companies. And if they don't, then they are going to be delisted from exchanges. Um, it was... Um, inexplainable, inexplicable to me why Chinese companies were getting that exemption in the first place, being treated differently from everybody else. So it seems to me that if people want to list their companies on U.S. markets, they need to comply with U.S. rules, the same rules that U.S. companies and other foreign companies must follow. So yeah. to me, um, this is not an escalation. This is something that should have been done a long, long time ago. And as I said, these exemptions for China shouldn't have existed in the first place. Like you just said, it should have been done a long, long time ago. Is the timing now a little bit suspect? Well, you know, it, that you'd have to talk to President Trump and, and the yeah. leaders in the Senate about what their motivations are. But there are a number of things that the United States should be doing. And if we remedy them now, um, then I, I think that we should do that now rather than later. So, um, you know, I, I can't speak to intention, but I think that there is, you know, obviously there's a new attitude towards China. Uh, you know, for decades, five decades, we tried to engage China, bring it into the international system, because our hope was that as it became stronger, um, it would see that it has a stake in maintaining that system. But on the contrary, China, as it grew stronger, has grown more uh, provocative and belligerent. And so, you know, I think there's just sort of a loss of... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, hope in, in the way China's going and a realization that our policies didn't work and they need to be changed. But as to what their, their the specific intentions are, you got to ask them. Okay. Now, even before the pandemic occurred, uh, the Trump administration has accused the Chinese government of corporate espionage, um, patent infringement, among other things. How much credibility would you give the administration for claiming that the Chinese have undermined American society? There have been a number of studies going back to the Blair Huntsman report of May 2013. You have a number of reports from the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, we don't know the exact amount that uh, China steals in U.S. intellectual property. But generally speaking, from a number of different sources, they've come up with an estimate somewhere in the three to four hundred billion dollar range. And we've seen estimates as low as 125 billion, 150 billion. There have been estimates 600 billion dollars a year. But uh -huh. whatever it is, it's enormous amount of theft. And so um, there's there's got to be credibility to this. You know, we have seen so many prosecutions of uh, people spying for China uh, who have been accused and convicted or pled guilty of stealing U.S. intellectual property. We know that it's a problem. Okay, let's talk about your new book that came out this year, Gordon, The Great U.S.-China Tech War. In the book, you've discussed the rivalry between two of the world's largest economies on the tech space. I'm just going to read a few passages from your book here. China's political leaders and their army of technocrats could soon possess the technologies of tomorrow. And you've also written that nowhere is America so far behind China as in the race to build the world's next generation of wireless 
telecommunications. Gordon, why is the competition in the tech space or the next tech war so relevant today? Well, it's, it's relevant because, you know, if you look at 5G, which is what you just mentioned, fifth generation of wireless communications, we're talking about the Internet of Things, which means that uh, almost every device is going to be connected to that global telecom backbone. And if Huawei has built that backbone, it would be in a position to filch the world's data. Uh -huh. uh, that is incredible in itself. But of course, that powers artificial intelligence. You know, the more data you put into an AI system, the better it is. Plus also, because all these devices are connected uh, to, into each other, it means that maybe these devices can be manipulated remotely, which means that China can lock or unlock your front door, drive your car off the cliff, or stop your pacemaker. So that's why this is important. And we've seen Huawei um, is in a commanding lead in terms of building out that telecom uh, backbone, and not only in the developed world, but also in our uh, allies. Uh, so this is going to be a critical issue for the United States going forward, whether there are other ways that we can uh, make up for some uh, lost ground, and a lot of lost ground, actually. What is the probability that China can sustain this technological lead, like you said, well into the future? But that's a great question, and um, there, there are reasons to believe it can and reasons to believe it cannot. Um, it, it has been able to devote substantial sums to the development of technology. So, you, for instance, in the 13th five-year plan, which is curves this period, also the Made in China 2025 initiative, enormous sums are going into this. The question is, can they continue that? And right now, their economy is probably still in contraction mode. They admitted to a 6.8% contraction in Q1, probably double that. Um, we know that there's been some sort of uptick in this uh, quarter. Uh, probably not enough to get them above zero. I mean, they weren't doing that well to start out with before the coronavirus epidemic, but the disease has uh, created a standstill there, as it's created in our country and many other countries. So it's going to be very difficult for any country to get its way out of it, but especially China. Because remember, China has an export-dependent economy. Its yeah. export markets right now are, are on their backs. In other words, European Union, United States... Uh, they're going to have a hard time finding replacements for the American consumer. Last question, Gordon. How is this technological lead going to translate to hard power um, for China? Will they be able to catch up to the U.S. in terms of military power? Um, well, you know, in terms of if you look at specific questions which the Chinese are interested in. So, for instance, if there were conflict in the South China and East China Seas, um, most military analysts believe that they don't have to catch up. That it's that the United States has to catch up. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, if you're looking at overall military power, the U.S. has a commanding lead, but we've got responsibilities around the globe. And really, this is a question of going back to the economy. If the Chinese economy is able to produce um, economic output, then yes, they're going to be able to uh, maintain um, that uh, critical dominance in their periphery, and they'll be able to catch up with the U.S. elsewhere. But I don't think they'll be able to do that for the reasons I mentioned. So I don't see China being able to sustain this. I see China is at high tide. And we see, I think the most important thing, David, though, is when you start to look at the attitude of other countries and the way they're viewing China, and the more that we learn, and going back to your first question, the more that we learned about what China did in terms of spreading the coronavirus beyond its borders, uh -huh. the less support Beijing will have. And I don't believe that they'll be able to maintain their challenge. So, yeah, uh, China's had a high tide um, and uh, it's going on a multi-decade slide. And you mentioned just in that point, you mentioned also that uh, China can be excluded from the global political arena. Is that true? I think that it probably will be. Um, eventually, because Beijing is doing things which are um, abhorrent to everybody else. As we see, for instance, in taking back the autonomy in Hong Kong, uh -huh. all of those boat bumping and other incidents in its peripheral seas against Japan, Taiwan, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines. Uh, you know, when you had a Chinese diplomat say that Kazakhstan should be part of China, I mean, that's stunning. This is this wolf warrior diplomacy 
which is losing friends for China fast. Unless China is able to take on everybody in the world and win, um, it, it is. I, I think that we are going to see China, as I said, uh, not being able to maintain um, its military, its tech dominance, all the other things that we have come mm. to accept in China. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Gordon. I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you, David. And don't forget to follow Gordon on Twitter at Gordon G. Chang. That's his handle. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.